The M1 series of main battle tanks have come to symbolize modern America's armored might on the battlefield, incorporating all the lessons of more than 50 years of armored warfare when it was first conceived. The M1 remains in the top tier of armored fighting vehicles thanks to a series of upgrades and looks set to remain there for many years to come. However, a rather cold and impersonal designation such as M1 doesn't really convey the history and legacy that comes with the introduction of a new tank. It needs a name that honors the traditions of the past while its technology builds on what came before. The M1 was intended to be a hard charger powered by a gas turbine engine and armed with a lethal 105mm main gun. It was intended to keep fighting with the intention of winning no matter the odds, and with this mindset behind them, the proponents of the new tank knew only one name could be bestowed on what was intended to be the final word in armored warfare. This is the story of Colonel Creighton Abrams, whose name was given to one of the best tanks in the world, leading the 37th Tank Battalion in the fight against Nazi Germany. But first, I'd like to thank Magellan TV for sponsoring today's episode. If you've tuned in to a Wars of the World video in the last few months, you've likely heard us rave about our partnership with Magellan TV, the best source for the hottest and most intriguing historical content available online. You know about their documentaries and bingeable television shows, and how they go beyond the realm of history to deliver unbelievable deep dives into other topics like space or true crime or the supernatural. In other words, there is always something to watch, no matter where your interests lie. This week, we want to highlight the documentary The Crater, A True Vietnam Story, a 57-minute picture taking us inside the mind of a former Australian conscript who served in the Vietnam War. The show doesn't simply focus on the terrors of war, however, but takes us through the hidden darkness that came with digging mass graves for the North Vietnamese soldiers. They do a difficult job of balancing themes of history, horror, and the impact deathly conflict has on mental health, telling an intriguing story while bringing humanity to those who were victims of the war. The Crater, A True Vietnam Story is also a new release, part of Magellan TV's 15 to 20 hours of brand new content they add to their library each week, always leaving fans with something fresh to binge and enjoy. Use the link in the description to access a free month trial and jump into the jaw-dropping adventure of The Crater, A True Vietnam Story, and other top-notch documentaries. Welcome to Wars of the World. Creighton William Abrams Jr. was born in Springfield, Massachusetts on September 15, 1914. Compared to many of his contemporaries during the Second World War, he was somewhat unorthodox, not hailing from a strong military family, his father being a railroad worker, while his mother was the daughter of an estate's caretaker. This rather modest background instilled in him a sense of self-determination, which was reflected in his academic studies, doing well at school despite having numerous jobs to help support him and his family, such as helping farm chickens and pigs. It's even more impressive when added onto this was his extracurricular activities, such as sports, where he captained the local football team during a highly successful season. In this regard, Abrams demonstrated that his drive and determination by no means translated into selfishness. He was a gifted leader who inspired those around him, and after deciding to join the US Army, he applied to the prestigious West Point Academy, where future officers are trained, being accepted on his many merits as part of the class of 1936. Upon graduating, he joined the cavalry, which was at that time still heavily centered on the horse, despite widespread mechanization taking place in other armies around the world, most notably Nazi Germany. Serving with the 7th Cavalry at Fort Bliss on the Texas-New Mexico border, Abrams' natural talent for leadership continued to shine brightly. 
He quickly earned a reputation as a lead from the front and by example kind of officer, while at the same time being able to read his men in such a way as to know how to keep them geared up for the tasks at hand. During one notable incident, while on a training exercise, a young private by the name Daniel Sanford was having trouble with a group of horses. The horse he was riding went left, while the others he was leading with a rope went around to the right. This inevitably pulled Sanford off his mount and dragged him across dirt and several cacti. Battered, bruised, and bleeding, instead of chastising Sanford as the private had expected, Abrams instead praised him in front of his comrades for not letting go of the rope, despite the physical punishment he was taking, allowing the private to eventually bring the horses back under control. Sanford later recalled how his smarting over the incident suddenly turned to pride. By the late 1930s, Europe seemed hell-bent on breaking out into another catastrophic war, and despite America once again claiming neutrality, despite widespread opposition to Hitler's fascist regime, this couldn't guarantee the country wouldn't get unintentionally dragged into the fighting. Thus, the US began gearing up for war, and in one area in particular, the army pushed hard for re-equipment and expansion. That was of the armored units, the tanks. In 1940, Abrams left behind the cavalry and joined the 4th Armored Division, where he soon became familiar with his new armored mounts. In the immediate aftermath of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the now 27-year-old Abrams, who held the rank of army captain, was given a temporary promotion to major in February of 1942, and was made second in command of the 37th Armour Regiment. Then, barely two weeks before his 28th birthday, he was promoted again to Lieutenant Colonel and given command of the regiment, which had then been redesignated as the 37th Tank Battalion, its motto being Courage Conquerors. Equipped with M4 Shermans as well as supporting vehicles, Lieutenant Colonel Abrams, or Abe as he became known to his men, continued his doctrine of leading from the front. Naming his personal Sherman Thunderbolt after intense training in the English countryside, he led the 37th into France on July 13, 1944. Fighting with the rest of the 4th Armored Division, the 37th helped spearhead the breakout from Utah Beach. Many of Abe's men were aghast at just how ferocious in battle he was, as one M4 driver later recalled, I can recall during our tank battles, Abe was shooting tanks like the rest of the boys. He would mix in wherever the toughest battle was. It made us feel like fighting harder when you could see a great man like Abe alongside of you. Abram's tenacity was soon recognized by the Germans as well, some of whom mistakenly believed he was Jewish due to some of his acquaintances during his education. In fact, Abrams was a Methodist. However, the rumor that he was an avenging Jew persisted amongst the German troops, who began to build a fearful picture in their mind of the 37th Tank Battalion's commander. This was spurred on by the repeated use of the 37th as the spearhead of many attacks undertaken by the 4th Armored Division, which was now assigned to General Patton's 3rd Army, Abrams and his men having proven themselves determined to win in battle. Abrams' tenacity was about to be put to the test when on September 18, 1944, the German Army's 111th Panzer Brigade attacked elements of the 4th Armored Division at Luneville, sparking the Battle of Arakor, which would become one of the largest tank engagements of the war. The Germans timed their attack on Luneville to coincide with poor weather, which denied the US troops support from their powerful air forces. Despite being equipped with superior tanks, the German attack was poorly coordinated, and the Americans rebuffed them, forcing the Germans to instead bypass Luneville and attack the 4th Armored Division's units in and around the town of Arakor, including Abrams and his men, on the following morning. Spearheaded by Panther tanks, arguably one of the finest tanks of the entire war, the German advance, which still enjoyed cover from thick fog, seemed to run into trouble everywhere it went. Almost half the force was separated when the officer commanding Panzer Brigade 111 stopped to ask a French farmer for directions who gave less than clear instructions, resulting in them muddling about trying to get to their objective. The remaining German tanks, which still outnumbered the American Shermans two to one, pressed on, however, but the element of surprise was lost when they repeatedly stumbled upon American troops and tanks, which used the fog to escape and report their position. 
The German tanks, unaware that their cover had been blown, emerged from thick fog, which at times provided less than 75 yards visibility, expecting to catch Abrams and his tanks napping. Instead, they found the Shermans and tank destroyers loaded and ready to fire. The deficiencies of the Sherman compared to the Panther and the legendary Tiger tank are well documented, but at such close ranges, where the shells retained much more of their energy after firing, the Sherman's gun did immense damage to the German tanks. The Battle of Arakor would see nine days of repeated, intense armored fighting, making it the biggest tank battle of the Western Front and would end in a German defeat. Of the 262 tanks and mobile guns deployed by the Germans for battle, 86 were destroyed, 114 heavily damaged, and only 62 remained operational by the end. Of these, Abrams and the 37th were credited with destroying 55 Panthers and Tigers, at the cost of only 14 Shermans, a truly remarkable feat that demonstrated superior tactics can win out in the face of greater enemy numbers and equipment. Frustratingly, however, instead of pursuing the retreating Germans as Abrams would have liked, he and the rest of Patton's Third Army were forced to taper down their offenses as resources were diverted to support Operation Market Garden in Holland. Ultimately proving a bridge too far when the operation failed, the 37th was on the move again, pushing further and further toward Germany. Time and time again, Patton called on Abrams and the 37th to blaze a path into battle for others to follow. Patton, himself a confident leader bordering on the narcissistic, recognized the incredible talent and tenacity Abrams frequently demonstrated in battle, and would remark, I'm supposed to be the best tank commander in the army, but I have one peer, Abe Abrams. He is the world champion. By December 1944, the 37th was punching through what was left of the old Maginot Line, the famous, supposedly impenetrable fortifications which were constructed by the French to keep Hitler in Germany. Shortly after this feat, Abrams and the 37th were withdrawn to second line positions to give them some downtime from the front, although even here they saw infrequent combat with remnant German forces. Then on December 16th, 1944, the 37th ceased being the liberators of Europe, instead briefly becoming an invasion force as they became the first 4th Division vehicles to cross the border into Germany itself. However, this triumph would be short-lived, as on that very day, the Germans launched their stunning offensive in the Ardennes Forest, sparking the Battle of the Bulge. The German aim was to charge all the way to Antwerp and thus split the Allied forces in two, and with speed being of the essence, this meant that they bypassed several pockets of American forces, including the 101st Airborne around the Belgian town of Bastogne. As if being cut off from supplies were not enough, that winter saw heavy snowfall and dense clouds, which again inhibited US air power from providing them with support, something the Germans had accounted for in their planning. As the Germans continued their drive towards Antwerp, Abrams and the 37th were part of the American counterattack, striking at the German bulge from the south. Patton then ordered Abrams to drive like hell towards Bastogne to link up with the 101st and relieve them. Abrams made his move on the morning of December 22nd, before encountering German forces that were unorthodox to say the least. The German forces consisted of paratroopers, but they were wearing American uniforms as part of their now infamous tactic to confuse and delay American movements in the wake of the offensive. The fight with the paratroopers was bloody and brutal, but Abram and his men were able to push forwards until at dawn on December 26th, they were within five miles of the besieged Americans. Between fighting the paratroopers and traversing mine-infested terrain, Abrams was down to 20 serviceable tanks, although he had no way of knowing just what lay between him and his objective. It was as he surveyed the scene that waves of Douglas C-47 transports roared overhead, using a break in the weather to start parachuting desperately needed supplies to the 101st at Bastogne. Encouraged by this development, he radioed Major General Hugh Gaffney, commander of the 4th Division, for permission to proceed, and once granted, Abrams returned to his tank, lit a cigar, and told his troops, We're going in to those people now. Let her roll. Supported by artillery fire and infantry, 
the 37th fought their way to the 101st, and just after 1700 hours, one of Abrams' lieutenants, Charles Boggs, climbed out of his tank and shook hands with a second lieutenant engineer from the 101st. The eight-day siege was over, and now the task of all involved was to hold the line against the Germans, while Patton's forces threw everything they had at the main German thrust. By mid-January, the last of the German bulge was knocked back, ending Hitler's last great offensive in the West, but it had cost the US Army 100,000 casualties, and the 37th had not come off unscathed, being rendered significantly under strength. Having been reinforced, Abrams led his men back into Germany before driving south into Czechoslovakia shortly before the war came to an end on May 6, 1945. Under the command of Abrams, the 37th had become one of the most respected combat units of the European theatre of operations, and celebrated as heroes for their fight towards Bastogne. Abrams was decorated for his service in the war, and these included two Distinguished Service Crosses, two Silver Stars, and the Legion of Merit, while the 37th received a Presidential Unit Citation for their actions at Bastogne. Being a career soldier, Abrams remained in the army after the war, seeing service in Korea, as well as during the Berlin Crisis in 1961, where he commanded the 3rd Armored Division. By the outbreak of the Vietnam War, he was appointed deputy commander of the US forces engaged in the conflict under his West Point classmate, General William Westmoreland, before succeeding him in 1968. When President Nixon took office in January of 1969, the new commander-in-chief held Abrams in very high regard and deferred to his judgment on several occasions. Having overseen the withdrawal of US forces in Vietnam in 1973, Abrams, now the US Chief of Staff, passed away from cancer on September 4th, 1974. Sadly, for a short time after his death, his image was tainted by his involvement in the Vietnam War. But over time, his exploits during the Second World War resurfaced, and today, it is as the tank commander who blazed a path to Bastogne that he is most remembered as. Perhaps summing up just how effective and revered a leader Abe was are the words of one Captain Abe Bao from the 4th Armored Division. He was sincere, honest, didn't speak down to people. In eight or ten words, he could put more emphasis than someone who spoke for an hour. He led his troops. He didn't have a headquarters out there in his lead tank. Instead, he was another gun in the tank.